so my route into product management was kind of varied as i think everyone's is there isn't kind of like a standard defined route into product management there isn't really very well defined career paths into into products so i was studying at university for mechanical engineering um and was learning about if i have a ball in my hand and throw it at a 70 degree angle with 10 newton meters of force and the wind is blowing you know southeast 50 miles an hour how many times will the ball bounce um kind of was sat in lectures and just thought this is not where i want to be or what i want to do i want to go do something a bit different um and then my so my mum's a high school teacher uh, she's a head teacher at a high school and she was like you've got to go do teaching like teaching is your vocation go do that um, and i did that for uh, two years at university and i was kind of like uh, i enjoy it but it's not something i want to do um so i decided i wanted to take a year out of uni and i just wanted to figure out what i wanted to do and what i would be good at and i always loved mobile phones um so even when i was studying childhood studies at university you know i um flew to Chicago, where my father-in-law is, for the launch of the iPhone, so I could be in an Apple store and I could kind of make sure I got my hands on one. So I'd always been like an Apple fanatic. So I thought, well, I know I love mobile phones, so why don't I just get a job doing something in mobile? So I got a job with one of the network operators in the UK called Telefonica, um, and originally it was just answering their calls in the contact center and saying, you know, how can I help you? How can I? Um, you know, people would phone me and say my text messages don't work or you know, I can't make a phone call, etc. So just triaging um, mobile issues. Got pretty good at that. Um, had some recognition from the CEO, which was nice, and then got promoted um, and was doing process improvement. So I became trained in Six Sigma and got a yellow belt in Six Sigma, so like um, lean efficiency, um, which just served me well in my product management um, experience. So I did a lot of lean stuff, a lot of Six Sigma stuff, looking at how we could take demand um, and waste out of the contact center and out of O2 in general, like online and, and elsewhere. Um, that was going really well. Um, and I got promoted again um, into being a business analyst. Because again, it was kind of like analyzing the business and looking at what we could do and, and where we could make improvements and working with um, old, old style product owners. So like kind of business people, no interest in software engineering, all about the commercials. And then I would be the business analyst, I guess, too bridge the gap. Um, being a BA was perfect because it kind of put me in this role where I learned to speak the business speak very well and I learned to speak the engineering talk very well. Because um, to me, a, a BA is kind of like a translator. It's just someone that can talk multiple languages to multiple different people um, and was kind of like the perfect training, I guess, for being a product owner. And what happened was O2, the network operator, realized that Mobile revenues are dying. You know, we're getting more and more over-the-top services like iMessage, WhatsApp, um, other, you know, VI, VOIP services, which were just killing their revenues. So they realized that they needed to take mobile and apply it into other industries. Um, so they were looking at applying it into healthcare, into mobile spending and wallets, into you know priority moments and and other bits and pieces. So I became a BA on the new products team, um, and there was really where I got my first chance to be a product manager because I was working on a health product um, way before the Apple Watch or wearables. It was something, a pendant you wore around your neck and it tracked your location and it did loads of cool things. Like um, say your doctor put you on suicide watch, um, the pendant would like phone the police if you went near a train line or like near the, a bridge or something like that. Um, so do loads of interesting stuff um, really based on location and having dashboards to manage all that. And when I look back, that's kind of where I started to become a product owner because the business guy had no idea how any of this would work. You know, he worked in the NHS before, so he got all the doctor side of things, but he just got zero of the um, product side of things. So he made me, I guess, like a quasi product owner. So I started to run the sprints and becoming more and more involved in the agile stuff and working with design teams. And it was really at that point where I didn't. I knew at that point I didn't want to go back to university. Um, I knew that, um, I mean, for one, I was on a better salary than I would have been <laughs> becoming a teacher. But for two, I just knew that I kind of found what I wanted to do. And it was um, the area that I wanted to work in. And I was talking at a conference and I got approached by someone from Asda, um, which is like Walmart in the US. And what I was doing at O2, like I said, was applying mobile tech into a non-mobile business. So like mobile into health. And at Walmart, the opportunity was really the same. It was applying mobile into shopping and, and offline shopping activities. 
So I joined um, Walmart about two and a half years ago, three years ago now, um, to lead their mobile efforts, firstly on e-commerce. So just getting the house in order and doing the basics right and making sure the mobile app uh, worked and was functional. We could build that out, making sure we had mobile websites and and all of that stuff was kind of fundamental to letting you do the cool incremental stuff. Um, And then after, I think it was about a year, 18 months, moved on to working on some of the in-store stuff. So I guess that's really where I came into my own around applying the mobile tech into a non-mobile arena. So working with things like iBeacons, install tracking, Wi-Fi tracking, you know, install messaging, um, install maps, all of that type of offline stuff. And really allowing mobile, I guess, to become the center of this offline online journey and the thing that can bring the two together. And I guess that's where I, I would say it was during my time at Walmart that I became like a, a good product manager, um, if there is such a thing. Um, and then I, I've been been at Walmart for about two, two and a half years. I knew that I wanted to carry on in product owner, uh, product management and do some new things. Um, I didn't want to necessarily continue to work in the retail space. I didn't want to become a retail specialist. You know, I think if you're a good product owner, you can kind of try your hand at everything. Um, the fundamental skills of product management cut across all the verticals of industries really well. Um, so fintech is kind of booming, especially in London. It's just like it's where it's at right now if you want to be doing cool stuff. Um, knew I wanted to work in fintech and the opportunity at TravelX was to start from a team of zero and then really build it up and build out from there um, across product management, engineering, design. Um, so that was just a phenomenal opportunity. It was too good to turn down. So I joined TravelX in January. Um, when I joined, I think there was like 10 of us. We're now at a team of 65. Um, we had no mobile apps. We now have two mobile apps that have both been featured by Apple in the App Store as the best new apps. One of our app went to number six in the App Store charts, which was above Spotify, Uber, Skype, eBay, kind of like absolutely killing it across all the big boys. Um, so success has been phenomenal so far. So that's kind of where I find myself. We're working on our third new product at the moment, um, which we've not yet announced, but hopefully it's going to kill it like the other ones did. Um, so now managing a team of product owners um, and working across multiple different products in multiple different spaces. So um, I guess an evolution um, into being a product owner rather than a revolution, um, really starting from process improvement, you know, lean principles around you know, how to get the most out of the, I guess, a little resource that you have. Um, then into business analysis and the whole translation piece. Then into Asda and Walmart, which is kind of like a corporate be a moth around managing stakeholders and all of that, those type of skills. And then at TravelX, really honing those skills into building a team and building teams, I guess, which build like amazing products. So that's kind of the evolution. I didn't go to university to train for any of this. Ismail Sadat, who I worked at O2, um, and he was the guy who taught me um, that most of the principles of Six Sigma before I went and did some training. And Ish was just all about pulling meaningful insights from data. I mean, anyone can kind of look at reams and reams and reams of data. Like you could get anyone off the street to look at data. And the real skill is pulling the patterns from the data and you know pulling the insights from the data. Now it's no good saying, you know, we have 100,000 customers using our product and 10,000 look at their homepage. It's kind of like, well, what does that mean? So they need to pull the actionable insight from that and say, you know, this shows the dropout here or like things like that. And Ish had an amazing knack for being able to do that. You could look at, you know, spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet and really be able to pick apart the data and pull apart the trends. And I think even though that's a very Six Sigma um, way of looking at things, that served me really well throughout my career in the sense of being able to balance the data and the insights with the customer feedback, um, which he was able to do really well. Being able to look at like Google Analytics for hours and actually being able to pull stuff out and make changes. We have so many product owners, not not at TravelX, just at TravelX, but I have product owners all over the show, which you know will like wear a badge that says like, oh, I know how to use Google Analytics. It's kind of like, well, big whoop, what can you actually pull from Google Analytics? I think being able to use Google Analytics and being able to use Google Analytics to pull insights are kind of two very different things. Um, and Ish was really about grounding me, I guess, in that data and that insight. He was also, I mean, for a Six Sigma person, he could do incredible presentations. Um, he could do presentations about data, which would read like a story and would kind of just enchant the people in the room into this story they was telling him. 
you know, by the end of it, you would have like the exec and the board just like nodding their head and like, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, you just go do your thing. Um, that was incredible. And I think being able to take that has been another strong thing. I mean, if you think of product, own, product ownership or product management, one of the biggest things is managing your stakeholders and keeping them informed and keeping them up to date. And actually, you know, an amazing presentation, which gives everyone the confidence that you know what you're doing and they can kind of leave you then to go away um, and act upon it is like the one of the best tools a product manager can have in their armory is that key stakeholder management through presentations. And yeah, Ish, Ish could just do the most amazing presentations. Um, you would almost be like, just like take my money and do whatever you like. That was incredible. Um, so being able, I guess, to learn from that was another, another great thing. If you're a good product owner, you're able to balance the data analysis and the customer insight. And I think I've been really, be I've benefited, I guess, from having Ish in the process improvement, which is very, very data heavy. And then when I worked at Walmart, I worked for a, um, a woman called Kate, Kate Cuthbertson. Um, and Kate was the most customer focused person you've ever seen in your life. Probably too, too far to one way, like probably needed to rein it in a little bit and listen to some of the data. Um, but actually working with two people that are so polarizing on their opinions of product and how product should work, it's kind of, I think, allowed me to hold that middle ground very well um, and be balanced. So Kate was just phenomenal for listening to customers and knew the customers inside out. So whenever we got carried away about wanting to do cool stuff, you know, oh, should we go implement, you know, search indexing in iOS 9? Or should we go implement, oh, should we rewrite the app into Swift? We'd kind of be able to rein everyone back and go like, whoa, 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 you know, what benefit is that to the customer? How is that going to make the customer feel? Um, I was very keen on doing needs analysis and understanding the needs and wants of customers and then building out from that. Um, so, yeah, I think Kate is probably the other person that's influenced my career the most heavily um, in the sense of, like I say, I, I I can see the benefits in both both approaches, um, especially in Ish, you know, process improvement, it's a bit difficult to be led by the customer entirely. You've got to be balanced in the data, but being able to work with two people that are so strong in their respective fields is really, I think, allowed me to hold, like say, the middle ground and pull on both approaches. I think that's um, one of the most important things. I knew I wanted to be a product manager when I was a business analyst. Um, so a business analyst, like I say, takes requirements from the business and then translates them to the tech. And the amount of time as a BA, I would be turning around to the business owners and screaming and going like, no, you know, stop, we need to do this. Like I've spoken to customers or I've done this and we need to change our approach. Um, and I guess they were inflexible and kind of knew their own mind and was like, no, this is what we want to go do. Uh, and it was around that time that I knew that I wanted to be a product manager in software development because I didn't want to become a commercial business manager who just looked at the numbers all day. You know, I wanted to stay close to the detail. I wanted to kind of get my hands dirty and muck in. Um, but I wanted that ownership of the product. I wanted to put the, the, yes, the final say or the book to stop with me around what we should do. Um, so, yeah, it was more from experience of being sat in between software development and business and being like crushed from both sides. And that I knew that really I wanted to displace this business element and become the product owner so I could own it end to end. So I think when I was at Walmart, what used to inspire me was just the sheer volume of customers that I was able to influence on a daily basis around what we do. Um, you know, we had 6 million downloads of the app. You make one incremental improvement that, I don't know, improves customer satisfaction or improves NPS by one or you know, two. It's kind of like they look like tiny, tiny improvements, but actually at such vast scale, the improvements you're having on people is phenomenal. From the same sense of, you know, from the same thing, from a business sense, you know, if we improved average order values by 5p, you know, in a small startup, that's kind of like, that's okay, but it's not going to get you anywhere fast. You know, at Walmart, you improve average order values for 6 million people. And overnight, you've just generated your millions in revenue throughout the year. So kind of like the scale of the organization and the impact you could have was inspirational. And also like the brand recognition. You know, you could talk to customers in the street or in the stores and say, oh, we've just made this change. And everyone would know it straight away and go, like, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Um, so you could see that actually on a day to day basis, you were changing the way that people were shopping or changing the way that people were using the product. Um, and that inspired me during my time at Walmart. I think what inspires me now is being able just to change, change money. If you, excuse me, if you think of TravelX, um, TravelX's core business is money and cash and exchanging cash. So fundamentally, you could say that someone gives us a green piece of paper 
and then we give them a red piece of paper in return. Um, and actually being able to apply jobs to be done to that and taking that a level up and going, well, it's not about the cash. It's about I want to transfer credit from me to you um, or from me to a business or somewhere else. Being able to redefine how money works internationally. Um, it's kind of like if that doesn't inspire a product owner, then I have no idea what would. Um, money is without a doubt the most fundamentally flawed product um, that's out there. There are so many conventions that have existed for hundreds of years and people just don't challenge the norm that to be able to go in there and just redefine the categories is inspirational. If you look at the banks, so for years the banks have existed and kind of been all about shareholder value. And the banks have kind of said, well, we're going to make the rules up and then we're going to punish you every time you break the rules, like overdraft fees, late payment fees, using the card abroad, yada, yada, yada. So they've just existed on having customers but punishing their customers the whole time. So being able to come into a category which has been like that for hundreds of years and actually be able to put customer value at the heart of what we want to do, um, I just think will be absolutely game-changing in this industry. And I think you're seeing more and more this come through um, in the fintech space, and that's why it's such a an exciting place to be. And that's why, yeah, I'm inspired every day to try and redefine how people spend money. I kind of, I wanted to say Tim Cook, but then I was like, that's just so cliche that I can't, I can't say Tim Cook. But obviously it would be obviously Tim Cook for like the number of reasons. When I talk about taking inspiration from people using your product, it's kind of like he can walk on the street and 50% of people are using one of the products he's responsible for. So customer insight and whatnot is, Phenomenal. The impact that you can have on people's day-to-day -day lives is, again, absolutely phenomenal. Apple changed one thing in the OS that makes it you know, marginally easier to send a text or to do anything than the impact that just has is phenomenal. They add like a moment of delight into the app, you know, like Siri and the jokes that Siri, say, Siri says. So those kind of like minimum lovable moments that you kind of have throughout the app. The impact they have is phenomenal. You know, they genuinely can put a smile on millions, like hundreds of millions of people's faces in Apple's case. So Tim Cook is the cliche answer. I think if I think about it a little bit more, then it's probably Mark Andreessen um, from A16Z. In the sense of those guys have invested in just some of like the most up and coming businesses, you know, Twitter, Skype, Instagram, Airbnb, all of those type of organizations that they've invested in. So I'd love to be in his shoes, I guess, for a, a number of reasons. I'd love to figure out what it is that he has that enables him to spot those opportunities. You know, is it some type of gut feel, just like an instinct for this type of stuff? Is there a methodology, you know, is there a science behind how they go about doing their investments and how he kind of can select these organizations? Um, but yeah, I'd absolutely love to be in his shoes and kind of get to grips with how they make such incredible decisions on what they do. Kind of like now to the extent that when, you know, Mark Andreessen invests in a product, that is the stimulus for other people to go and invest in that product because they've been so successful um, in investing. It's making, I think, other investors a bit lazy because they can just sit on their hands now and wait for those guys to get involved and then they can jump in and be all over it. So I'd absolutely love to know what their secret source of Mark Andreessen's uh, investments was and how he came to those conclusions. That would be phenomenal. So I think the most exciting thing about my products at the moment is um, the job that we're trying to solve for is money. Um, and there is no more emotive product in the world than money. Nothing excites customers more, you know, causes customer pain more than money. So actually to be able to look at money as a product, um, which at the moment ultimately is just a piece of printed paper that, you know, you, you exchange, it's just an exchange of credit. You know, I have some credit, I want to give it to somebody else and money is the medium, sorry, paper is the medium in which that happens. Um, so being able to look at money um, as a product in general and kind of deconstruct that into different parts, um, there is nothing more exciting than to be able to do that. When I talked to before about, you know, touching customers and having the biggest impact you could possibly have, what bigger impact could you have than changing the way that people spend money? Um, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Like I say, if that doesn't excite a product owner, the chance to redefine money, then I have no idea what would it's the most fundamentally flawed product in the market. It's, when I talk about customer insight, on money, you could literally talk to any person in the world to do customer insight on money. It's not like this small subset of people that you would have to go talk to. It's anyone, everyone and anyone um, suffers the pain. You mean you've got to be careful because you don't want to suffer inertia and go, 
well, this really pisses me off about money. So I'm going to go build, fix that for a million other people. Um, so it does, you have to be pretty wary given that you're in that space. Um, but actually being able to redefine something as fundamental to society as money is, is phenomenally exciting. Money as a, money as a product could, could well die and should probably die. You look at in other cultures, not everyone has this concept of money. It's more a concept of credit. So I think if you look at money as a, as a job and jobs to be done, I think you've got three. You've got storing credit, you've got borrowing credit, and then you've got transferring credit. And that transferring credit either happens in person, so money, or happens um, remotely, so debit cards, credit cards, online purchases. So you can actually deconstruct it into these jobs and kind of you could eliminate money. Um, I'm not sure it will happen in the, in the near term. Um, but actually, like, how exciting is that opportunity to be able to look at money as a product? Um, yeah, I just there is not a more exciting product that you could look at. The power to change the world. Um, and it, it is. I mean, being a product owner can be a power trip, and you've got to make sure that you don't fall foul to being egotistical and having that power trip. But actually, as a product owner, you are able to make products which can change customers' lives. And, and by changing customers' lives can change the world. Um, you look at the iPhone, you know, that the iPhone has changed the modern society. Um, you look at other products, like I said before, like Uber, Spotify. You know, think of music. Music is thousands and thousands of years old. And Spotify have literally changed how that thousand-year-old industry worked. And they have just taken it, smashed apart existing conventions, um, and changed how people now can see music. Um, so having that power to be able to, I guess, leave your imprint on history and leave your imprint on the world um, is just, yeah, that's the best part about being a product owner. You can leave a legacy. Roadmaps, <laughs> and roadmaps being used as a security blanket by other people. Um, yeah, roadmaps where, I guess, you are basically asked to put a to create a noose and hang the noose around your head and then everyone can wait to kick the platform from underneath you when you don't hit the roadmap. Um, so basically taking some fundamentally waterfall principles and attempting to apply them into agile teams. Um, so roadmaps are one of the, the bane of my product management life. Um, also, I spoke before about the value of doing presentations and how you can really win people over with amazing presentations. Um, but also as a product owner, it's easy to be swamped in presentations and swamped in having to do this outward communication to different groups of people and to do various amounts of education and justification. So, yeah, I think that the worst thing can be roadmaps if they're not handled correctly and if you're not in the right type of organization to handle agile. Um, oh yeah, and death by PowerPoint is something which many product managers fall foul to, I think. So I always imagine that product insights, I always break them down into three component parts. So the first one um, is one that no one can ignore and it's business insights. So it's more the strategic direction the business wants to go in and you know the business imperatives. You've got to put them as one part of the, the product insight that you're trying to build. And then for me, it's two. People say data and analytics and kind of and customer centricity and put them as two separate things. But I almost see the data and analytics as the you know quant quantitative customer data. Ultimately, the data analytics is customer data. It's just in a different format. And then you've got actually the raw customer data. And I think I like to do customer insight um, and speak to customers and do uh, we follow jobs to be done at Travel Act as a methodology at Walmart. We did uh, needs and wants analysis. Um, but then you need to balance that with the data and analytics. If you only listen to customers, you know they'll tell you that everything you want to build is amazing. You'll get all this like positive feedback. Um, you've got confirmation bias and all different types of things that customers will conform into. And it's the data and analytics which really back that up. I think the best example of this is whenever we do usability testing. So whenever I want to usability test the app, customers in, I drop video of them using the app. Um, and then we'll show customers something and we'll be talking about the app and how the app made them feel. And then we'll say to them on a certain page, oh, did you know you had to click the next button to get to the next page? Customer will go, yeah, of course I did. But then you'll show them the data and analytics of their eye tracking. And you'll go, well, why were you looking all over the screen for the three seconds before you went and clicked the next button? And then they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, it was a little bit confusing about where it is. So it's kind of like if you only listen to one or the other, you're not getting the full picture. Um, like say customers, I wouldn't say they lie to you, but they're kind of influenced by lots of other factors. Like group think if you're in a focus group, 
confirmation bias if you're in an individual one-to-one -one setting. Um, the data and analytics, on the other hand, doesn't either tell you the full picture, doesn't tell you how it made people feel, um, which is an incredibly important part. So I think being able to marry those two bits of data is the most in, important part of being a good product owner and understanding what customers want. The biggest lesson that I've, I've learned has definitely been, I was told by my first boss was never stop learning. And that's not a product thing. That's just kind of like an invaluable career kind of life skill is never stop learning. In our industry, we're fortunate in the sense of our skills are quite transferable across multiple products. You know, so we can uh, be a product manager in FinTech and actually move to retail pretty easily. Um, but actually things evolve over time, um, technologies evolve. If you look at mobile, you know, like when I started in mobile, we had the iPhone, the original iPhone. Now we're on the success, it does incredible things. You know, we've moved from Objective-C to Swift, we've done all different types of things. Look at Android, we've gone from like Eclipse and tool chains to um, Android Studio, Gradle and things like that. Um, so there's been all types of changes, even within existing industries, which from the outside don't seem to be changing. Um, so continual learning is the way to keep yourself one step ahead of the game. You know, as a product manager, you trade on credibility. Credibility is kind of your currency with your team. Um, and actually learning and having the knowledge that you can share with those guys, or at least you can keep up to speed with what they're saying, um, will really enable, I think, you to become a good product owner and, and have a rich product career. You know, since the age of six, I've never not been in school or university at one point or, the, or another. So that means continually there is new things to try out, new methodologies. And you can sometimes take like lessons you've learned in Six Sigma and then a lesson you've learned in some HR course and actually find a way that you pair them together, which gives you this really unique um, approach to things. And actually that kind of innovative approach and that continual learning really, for me, enables you to step on from everybody else, um, keep up to speed with things that are changing um, and become the best product owner you can. I think every product owner has learned this lesson about being over optimistic with dates um, is kind of, I'm, I'm yet to meet a product owner that when someone says, when will this be done by, actually gives a realistic date. You know, every product owner, when they get challenged for a date, will go this date. And it's kind of like, that's the date that a product owner can hit. If everything in the world goes well and kind of like, there is not a blocker, no roadblocks, there isn't like, anyone's sick on the team it's kind of like everyone's 100 percent capacity working 24 hours a day yes we can hit this day but like that blue sky world never happens and then you risk ruining the reputation not just of yourself but kind of as of, of the of the skill and the art of product management um by not delivering on those dates so i think the toughest lessons i've learned are you know around being realistic on dates if you think you can do it in a month it will not take you a month. It will take you longer than a month. Um, it's one of the inaccuracies you know, in Agile when you look at like estimations and sprint estimations. The reason in sprints that we don't estimate in time and days is because humans are inadequate at estimating in days and time. And that's why we use story points and use burn down charts and velocity because that's it's the better way of doing it. People are always over optimistic on dates. And the thing is, as a product owner, you want to please everyone. You know, like that's what you're in the business to do. Um, and that includes business stakeholders and, and customers. You want to deliver value to customers as soon as you possibly can. Um, but you do need to be real realistic with dates. I have been burned many times um, by giving unrealistic dates. And often like off the cuff, you know, someone will say, oh, like roughly when do you expect to do that? And I go, well, maybe in March next year. And all the person hears in all that conversation is the word March and nothing else. So come February, you know, people are knocking on your door and saying, well, you told me March. Um, so actually being realistic with dates, building out on dates a lot better, not estimating in time is definitely the hardest lesson I've learned. Um, and one that I have seen every single product owner I have ever worked with, I have seen them make that mistake. Um, I am yet to meet someone that has never made that mistake in their life. I think inertia in product management is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, it's so easy sometimes if you sit within the customer demographic of the product you're building to use yourself as a customer insight to go, well, you know, well, I was using the mobile app yesterday and I really struggled doing this thing. Um, but you're not. It's just inertia. It's your own product. You're not a realistic example of customers doing it. And I see it all the time. Any team I've ever built who builds a checkout process moans about the checkout process being too long and too complicated. 
but that's because they fill it out a hundred times a day whilst they're testing and going through the checkout process. And it's kind of like, well, if you're going to do it a hundred times a day, it's going to piss you off because the best thing is that it just doesn't happen and it's just not there. But actually as a customer, that's unrealistic to expect that that would happen and you kind of got to gather that data. Um, so inertia is absolutely um, huge in product owners. You know, the number of times I see guys who will go, oh, well, do you know, in iOS, we can now do touch ID. So we should implement touch ID in these a thousand places throughout the app. And you're kind of like, well, our customers are 60 years old and running iPhone 4S. Like, so what about touch ID? Do it in four years time. You know, like when they've had the hand-me-downs and they're now on the success. Maybe you can do an educational piece and bring those guys on board. Um, but actually inertia is, is kind of like a disease in product management. It's very, very easy to spread. It only takes one product owner in a team to begin to use their cell um, as a survey of one and go unchallenged before the whole team believe that that's kind of the acceptable thing to do. So the way to, I guess, learn that lesson and overcome it is in every single product meeting we have, when people go, well, I think this is just to kind of shoot them down straight away and go, we're not building for you. You know, we're not building a product for one person. We're building a product for a pool of customers. Or when people go like, oh, well, anecdotally, I spoke to my mum yesterday and my mum said this. It's kind of, well, she's your mum. She's going to tell you she loves it. She's not going to point out all its flaws. Um, so inertia is absolutely huge um, issue in product management. It's one to avoid like the plague. Um, and actually, it's most helpful if you work in a team which is aware of that and can ground one another in it. If you try and do that yourself, you'll be reasonably successful, but you'll be most successful in a team where no one stands for inertia and everyone is very hard on making sure it's eradicated. I think, so the other thing that's hard lesson to learn is definitely around people management. Um, product manager is in a difficult situation in the sense of they have no direct line management responsibility for anyone on the team. You know, I can't walk over to one of the engineering team now and say, do this or you'll be fired um, because I can't, that's not, that's not my job. But I mean, I would want to, but I, I can't, I don't have that authority. Uh, no product owner typically does. You have zero um, line management authority over anyone. So you've got to build those interpersonal relationships with people. You've got to, you know, your credibility is one of the biggest things you're going to trade on, your reputation um, that you'll build within that team. So building those interpersonal relationships is one of, um, the hardest lessons to learn. It's one of the hardest things to figure out. Like there are some teams which are really receptive to one way of working and others which are different. So like the existing team I work on right now, if you pull everyone into a room and go, I've got this amazing idea, this is what we should do. They will absolutely tear strips out of it and you will face a big battle to try and get anywhere with it. But actually, if you take the time to speak to people individually on a one-on-one -on -one basis, explain the product, explain what it is you want to do, you know, why you want to build the feature and how you want to do it. And then like a week later, get them all in a room when they've all had time to think it through. Then the results are like night and day in terms of their buy-in. And their buy-in is ultimately related to the quality of the product. Um, so building those interpersonal relationships, figuring out different people's styles and who you need to warm up and maybe who you need to pull to one side. And um, yeah, building those relationships is, is key. If it was a product owner or manager, you take the word manager from your title and think, right, I can go boss this team about. You are going to run into a world of pain um, when engineers have, you know, RC product owners who think they can dictate. Um, it's just a recipe for disaster. So, yeah, definitely work on building those interpersonal relationships. Work on, you know, building the rapport with your engineering team. Build that credibility, that reputation. Um, and then you'll actually get places. But the biggest mistake you can possibly make is thinking that you have the authority over the people in your product team. So I think integrating Six Sigma as a product owner can be quite difficult. It depends what type of product owner you are. I always say there, there are two, for me, two distinct groups of product owners. You've got product owners who launch products. So they're very good at you know, customer insight, launch plans, and really rallying teams around building a product from scratch. And then you've got product owners which are really good at optimizing products onto in life and the kind of in market and you're looking at like conversion rate optimization or all of those type of incremental activities that you do. I think as a Six Sigma practitioner, those skills really come in around the optimization and the lead principles there. In terms of the launch, it's difficult because you're so highly focused on getting the product to market and doing the customer research and the customer insight. So there, there is grounding in that, but not so much. It's really when you're looking at optimizing a product and how you build out um, a product that's in market, that's where the lean comes in. 
down from, you know, the heavy amounts of focus that Six Sigma puts on data and analytics and, you know, understanding to the half a second how long tasks are taken and how you can, you know, map those tasks out to actually then reduce the, the wastage out of the process. And whilst I guess Six Sigma is always seen as a very business focused thing, it's kind of a business saying, how can we cut costs or how can we be more efficient? I think it does tailor itself really well into customer activities because a customer is just like a business. It doesn't want wastage. It, it the customer doesn't want wastage throughout a process. You know, no customer wants unnecessary clicks through the pages. They don't want unnecessary wait times and things like that. So actually, you can still put a customer angle on Six Sigma and look at how do you reduce the wastage out of a process to, I guess, best enable the customer to use a product. So I think yeah, Six Sigma definitely depends on the life cycle of the product and where you sit. If you sit in an in-life product, then there are definitely principles you can take from that around wastage reduction. I would say dra almost drown in the data and analytics. You know, you, to implement Six Sigma well, you do need to be knees deep in the data. Um, obviously, you need to retain the focus around the customer and, and making sure you're doing the right things. I'm not saying become a data freak, um, but you need to really, really understand end-to-end -end the data. Um, if you don't, then you need to go back and look at your data and analytics and re-implement them. Six Sigma works well when you follow the data and analytics and you listen to the data and analytics. It doesn't work very well if you begin to make assumptions on things that you think. Um, really, Six Sigma is grounded in the numbers uh, and demonstrating the improvement through the numbers. So make sure you've got a house in order with the data and analytics. Like say if you've not, go back to the drawing board and look at you know, Google Analytics or another analytics tool to get that data. Uh, and once you've got that, it's about thoroughly understanding the numbers, looking for patterns and behaviors that you can see in the numbers and then instrument it on from there. And do you know, it's exactly like building a product. So if, if you think of building a presentation like building a product, the first thing you would do is customer research and customer insight. And you would say, what does the customer expect from this product? What does the customer want from this product? So it's exactly the same with PowerPoint. You know, what is the audience expecting to learn from this presentation? And then building out from that kind of um, foundational understanding that you can gain. I think I've always found the most useful thing to be is invest the time upfront before anyone asks you to build a PowerPoint presentation which explains the rationale of the product, your insert, your research, uh, your insert, uh, sorry, insert, insight and research um, into the product and into why you're doing what you're going to do, um, and then pitch that at a really low altitude, so really low level detail. And then actually, every presentation you do for the next three months will build, be a build out of that presentation. You know, it will be taking slides from that, it will be removing slides from that, kind of give yourself this template which explains the product and everything you're doing, and then go out from there. Because otherwise you end up, you know, these last minute requests for PowerPoint presentations, you've got half an hour, an hour to try and pull something out of thin air to explain a product. And invariably you do a reasonable job, you know, best endeavors that you can. And um, But actually if you invest the time up front in doing that, it makes the death by PowerPoint easier to stomach. Um, given actually you're just remixing existing collateral that you've already got. Balance of data and analytics and customer centricity, um, which plays into all the things we've just spoken about. You know, customer centricity around like roadmaps and themes of roadmaps, you know, in terms of um, customer centricity around inertia and not being um, bogged down by product inertia and thinking everything's for yourself. If you can balance those two things, that's where you become the most effective product manager. I've worked in teams where you have product owners which are really good at the customer centric part or custom uh, product manager teams which are really good at the data part but ultimately they're not that effective unless they're paired together and kind of like can push against one another to try and get to the middle ground if as a product owner you can be fully conscious um, that you will have a bias and a tendency towards one side or the other and then try and manage that out yourself i think that's how you become the most effective product manager you know i'm absolutely massive on self-reflection um, so for an hour, every Friday morning for an hour, I take myself out of the office. I go downstairs in the office block and sit by the canal outside. And I just reflect for an hour on the week. Um, I have like a set of questions I ask myself, a set of you know, statements that I go over, um, and I look back on the week. And then that's then when I do my grounding in, well, have I been overly data-centric this week? Have I been overly customer-centric this week? And how do I need to change my behaviors? The reflection is perfect because you are able to change behaviors through reflection. I always think it's really interesting why people kind of say, well, you know, you are a data person or you are a customer person. And I always use the example that when you have like your first day at work in a new office, you, you're normally a different person than the person you are. 
or when you go for an interview, you're slightly different than the person you actually are. The, the classic one is a first date. If you go on a first date, you're pretty different than who you are. You know, there's no dirty cups lying around and whatnot. Everything's spick and span and you're kind of this amazing gentleman that you may or may not be. So you can change your behavior for distinct periods of time if you're conscious of wanting to change your behavior. So reflection is the opportunity to identify the areas of behavior that I want to change um, and then act and go and change on that. And that's how I find this balance of customer centricity and data and analytics. Uh, and I think that makes me an effective product owner. It means that week on week, it's kind of like a mini, a mini um, retrospective. You could look at it, you know, like what's worked well this week, what's not worked so well, what topic do I want to think a little bit more about, and I want to. So yeah, um, personal reflection is absolutely fundamental for me in becoming an effective product owner and balancing those two balls of data and customer centricity. And I have loads of like little statements that I go over. I mean, it's kind of like geeky and I guess a bit personal, but I have. Um, there's a really famous statement from Alex Ferguson, who's the Manchester United manager or was the Manchester United manager. And I'm a, a massive Manchester United fan. Um, but he always uh, recalls this story he told his players one day where he used to say to them, uh, you know, I was walking down a street one day and I came across three bricklayers. And I said to one of the bricklayers, what are you doing right now? And he said, I'm earning £10 an hour. And he went to the second bricklayer and said, you know, what are you doing? And the guy said, I'm laying bricks. And then he went to the third bricklayer and he said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm building a cathedral that one day I will bring my grandchildren to and it will be a wonder to behold and I will be able to stand there and say, I built this. So in my reflection, I have little things like that that I read every week and I always reflect back and think, have, has my behaviors reflected that? You know, this week, have I been in work just collecting a paycheck? This week, you know, have I been in work just writing user stories and doing the thing? Or actually this week, have I been in work and have I been building like world-class game-changing products? And that kind of reflective process then enables me next week to go, well, if this week I've just been collecting my paycheck, next week I better up my game and change my behaviors to reflect this. So that weekly reflection of running through those type of topics um, really, I think, helps me like focus myself for the next week and, and do that. But you've got to take the time out of the office. I don't think it's something you can do at your desk. I kind of go to a new location, a new place and kind of, think about it and go through it and try and exhibit those type of behaviors. The best thing to describe reflection, I think, in retrospectives is the first uh, Winnie the Pooh book, the, the first um, paragraph in there, says something like, um, here comes Edward Bear walking down the stairs, bump, bump, bump on the back of his head. He thinks there ought to be a better way of coming down the stairs. If only he could stop bumping for a minute and think about it. And it's a, an image of Christopher Robin dragging Winnie the Pooh down the stairs, bumping his head on the back of the stairs. And that's reflection, you know, the bump, 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 bump of product daily life, you know, banging your head against stakeholders and engineers and sprint planning and all those things. Like there ought to be a better way of doing it if only you could stop bumping in for a second and think. And that's reflection. Reflection is just the hour out to stop the bump in and kind of think about, is there a better way of doing things? If you ever struggle for inspiration, I mean, because everybody has those days where kind of like as a product owner, you feel the world is against you. You know, you've got difficult stakeholders up your back and you kind of down in the dumps and, and whatnot. There is nothing, no medicine better for a product owner than customer insight and just sitting with customers and trying to, it does a, a number of things. For one, it grounds you again. Because as a product owner, it's easy to get, an, you know, uh, I guess you would say like an elevated sense of self-worth where you kind of think you're a rock star product owner or you're working in rock star teams and you guys are amazing. And there is nothing better than being grounded again by the customer. But also the customer is the thing that will begin to inspire you. Because when you hear customers, you know, say things like, oh, this product's really causing me pain or these are the things I really want to get done and it's really frustrating me. I think if you can't draw inspiration from that, then perhaps you're in the wrong industry. Like that is the nectar of a product owner is hearing that type of stuff and being inspired by what you can then go and change. Um, so for me, if you ever searching for inspiration, I don't know um, what direction to take next. Customer insight and spe speaking to customers is there is nothing better. I think it doesn't have to be done in a lab-based thing. So people always hear customer insight and think it's going to be really expensive. I don't really know what to do. Um, but there are all types of things you can do. You know, like when I worked at Asda, you would assume that I went and stood in one of the stores and I would, you know, talk to people in the stores. But no, like I would be on the bus on the way to work and I would see somebody on the app. So I would call them on the bus and say, oh, you know, 
I work on that app, what you're doing, you know, how you're going to use it. Same if I was on the train, just talking to friends and family about it. It's kind of, if you don't hold your product dear and love your product, then that customer insight might not be that inspirational. But if you can find that and work on a product that you love, then that customer insight will be the biggest amount of inspiration you will need. Like I say, it's kind of like the perfect medicine to any product manager disease or kind of virus you can contract around being down in the dumps. So whenever I get asked about jobs to be done, I always try and use an example of someone drilling a wall. So if we look at, if we compare needs and wants analysis and jobs to be done as two different methodologies. So let's say we work for Black & Decker or another drill company, JTB, um, and we're analyzing someone drilling a hole into the wall. If we follow needs and wants analysis, we'll say to the customer, you know, what, what is it you want? What are the problems with this current solution? So a customer will probably go, the drill, it's a bit messy, it gets dust everywhere. The battery life is pretty terrible. It's not quite powerful enough. People always have problems like losing drill bits and things like that. You know, I can't get the right hole for the size that I want to drill in the wall. But the issue there is, and I hate to use it because it's so cliched, but the Henry Ford thing of, you know, if I'd have asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And that's the type of stuff that you're going to get when you talk to customers in that way. You're going to find out how you take the existing solution and incrementally improve it. Um, so needs and wants analysis. Let's say for the drill, we add, I don't know, like something that sucks the dust out as the drill goes through the wall. So, you know, we make a bit of a dent in the drill market. We sell a couple of hundred new drills because people are amazed at this thing. And that's what we do. But if you look at jobs to be done, jobs to be done says that a customer hires a product to do a job for them. And you've got to deconstruct the job that someone hires that product to try and achieve. So if we look at the example of someone drilling a hole in the wall, you hire the drill, not to drill, but you hire the drill because you want a hole in the wall. So if I said to you now, okay, we're going to improve putting a hole in the wall, we don't end up with a drill that's got a better battery life and sucks dust away. We end up with something completely redefined and something completely different. You could even take the job one level up and say, people don't want to put a hole in the wall. It's pretty crappy when you've got holes all over the wall. All you want to do is hang a picture up. So actually, we look at that again and say, well, maybe we should do picture hooks that kind of like self-adhesive and stick to the walls, or maybe we should do these other things. So Jobs to Be Done really allows you to move away from reinventing a current solution and kind of making these incremental improvements to what you're doing and just look at how you completely like redefine a category um, all over. I think if you look at people like Uber, you know, Uber didn't sit there and go, how do we just incrementally improve a taxi? You know, otherwise, we just have black cabs, which are a bit cleaner. Um, and arrived on time driving around London. You know, they had to strip it back and go, no, people want to go from A to B. You know, how do we build out from that journey of going from A to B? You know, there's numerous other examples of amazing products where clearly they didn't just go, how do we incrementally improve it? Kind of the perfect example of jobs to be done for me, you could even say is the iPhone. You know, otherwise we would have had a marginally better camera, you know, a marginally better phone, a marginally better device to read on the internet. But actually, by taking a step back and looking at the jobs that people want to try and achieve, that's how they were able to completely redefine the category. Um, so that's the difference. I, I'm not discounting needs and wants analysis. For some organizations, that's absolutely the right thing to do. So if you think of an organization like Walmart or Asda, they don't want to reinvent the shopping experience. Largely, they want to incrementally improve that shopping experience to make it better for their customers versus their competitors. Whereas actually when you move into the fintech space right now, fintech is all about reinventing categories and reinventing categories. So the needs and wants analysis has its place in the product owner's toolkit. Um, but really, if you want to try and redefine something, then jobs to be done is the way to kind of deconstruct the problem. Traditional waterfall says a roadmap is pretty much like a Gantt chart. You know, it just says like this activity and then this activity and then this activity. Um, but as we know in Agile, things just don't work like that. And you know, if we're to define 12, 18 months out what the team are going to be working on, then we're going to be working on ideas which are 18 months old. Um, you know, especially in fintech, like this industry just changes so fast that if you're planning 18 months out, then you're out of date already. Um, so I like to plan the roadmaps around themes. So we take customer problems or like jobs to be done. Um, and then we would put those jobs to be done. We would then impose them on a roadmap. So we would then say, to you know, the senior management or whoever else. You know, in this quarter, we're looking at the theme of customers collecting currency, for example, at Travel Hacks. There is zero commitment there to build a certain feature, use a certain technology, 
do any of those things, you know, ship a product on a certain day, to you know, achieve certain metrics. It's kind of like, we are just looking at this theme and this area of improvement. So by doing that, it kind of gives them the comfort and reassurance that we're looking at areas that are meaningful to them. Um, gives us that reassurance that we're not forced onto dates or forced onto building products which are out of date. Um, so really works for both sides um, of the fence. And also it's perfect because it senses everyone back around the customer. So it's not, you know, oh, we're going to build an app that does rate tracking, for example. Kind of like, that's fine. And that's very business driven, but what's the customer value? If you said, we're going to explore how customers can get the most value from their money, rate tracking might be the output of that. That might be the feature that you build, but you're not committing to do that. If you're going to go and discover the problem, work through that, you know, do some design explorations and then center back in on the product. So having themed roadmaps is definitely the way that kind of works for every party involved in, in roadmaps. So I found that to be without a doubt the most successful way of managing product roadmaps. You've got two, two elements to a roadmap. You kind of got the themes of things that you're going to look on, look at, and then you can sit down. So I'd sit down with the other product owners in the organization and say, okay, well, you know, I'm working on this theme and actually in two months time, you're working on that theme and that is very similar to what we're working on. So let's do some alignment. So there definitely needs to be alignment within a product team on the themes that people are working on and looking for adjacencies in terms of how teams can work better together. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're always going to get dates in from other people where they say, we've got to do this by this date. Um, I always try and not put that on the roadmap and put it elsewhere. I kind of, kind of hold the roadmap as like this uh, sacred document that won't be uh, demonized by dates and other things. Um, but also I do, I mean, I put an element of time on there. So the like Q2, Q3, Q4, but I also have an arrow across, an arrow that grows. And that is just labeled, you know, I think I call it increase in amount of uncertainty. So people know that if I say in Q1, we're looking at this theme and we're in Q1 right now, then we're definitely looking at that right now. In Q2, I tell you this theme, that means we're probably going to look at that. In Q3, that means we might look at this. And in Q4, that kind of means finger in the air. It feels like we might be looking at that. Um, but really, with each quarter, it has a growing amount of uncertainty and a growing amount of lack of commitment to doing that. Um, but yeah, so really focused about the near term type of activities um, that we can do. And we, we're going to prepare to be committed on um, with increasing amounts of uncertainty moving out from there. So then I guess that's where your user stories come into play. And we start to deconstruct things into epics and user stories once we've done the exploration. So say we are tackling, um, let's use rate tracking as that example. So, you know, customers want to extract the most amount of value. Um, from doing that. So we would start with some design explorations and we would, you know, do, we operate like a double diamond. So we take the problem and then we explore and go outwards from there and go really wide and wide ranging with what we could do. So customers extracting the most amount of value could be tell them to go to a competitor website on one side of things. You know, it could be build rate tracking on the other side of things. It could be offer better prices um, as another thing, but we would go wide with the design explorations. We would then pick a theme and then narrow down onto that theme. So say it was ultimately rate tracking that came back down and we said, okay, the way to deliver customers better value is to go and track rates. Then we move into doing UX and that's when we do the double diamond again. So we start to go out with our explorations and go wide and as weird and wacky as we can think. Uh, and then we constrain and we come back in and that's when we land on a solution. So we operate this double diamond. And then once we have that solution, then that's when we start to break it down into user stories, epics, all the types of activities you would associate at that point. So kind of this double diamond allows us to really expand our thinking, um, but at the same time use then the backlog um, as the management tool to manage what the sprint is. But that's not on the roadmap. That's far too granular for the roadmap. You know, a story can move from sprint to sprint. A roadmap kind of looks for more detail than that, and that's the detail that we can't afford to give. So it started, I think the minimum, I call it minimum lovable product and um, MLP is the, the thing that we do. And it really starts with MVP and I guess the bastardization of the term of MVP. So MVP is all about um, smallest investment, biggest amount of learning. Um, but it is, yeah, it's been bastardized by product owners, business people who now see it as, you know, the shittiest product that we can ship that people might buy is kind of like what you do. I Googled the other day, I was trying to write a blog post about MLP. So I just Googled, oh, sorry, I went on Twitter, put like minimum viable product in there. 
you want to read some of people's explanations of it. It has been completely misused from its principle. So I kind of use MLP as a substitute for MVP in some senses, because the minute you start to say to people around the business, this is the minimum lovable product, instantly they're away from this, oh, it's gotta be viable. You know, it's like just about viable, and we're saying it's gonna be lovable. So people's expectations are instantly raised when we start to say minimum lovable product as a term. Um, the problem with MVP as well is minimum viable product. It's got the word product in there, which to people means something that you ship. It's not something that you throw away or a prototype or a product is something which ends up in the hands of customers. Um, so for a multitude of reasons, like moving away from MVP, the term is dying, I think, um, amongst the community. Like if I wanna do experiments at Walmart or here, I call it minimum viable experiment because then instantly people go, ah, well, yeah, you, you don't ship an experiment to a customer, like hell no. Um, you know, so people are instantly bought on side that this is an experiment. It's minimum viable, so people are aware it's not the biggest experiment we can do. It's kind of like this whole uh, biggest amount of learning for smallest amount of investment. So I have minimum viable experiment and then minimum lovable product. And the minimum lovable product is what we'll ship to customers. And often um, I'll talk to other product owners and they'll go, oh, well, can you give me an example on your roadmap of a minimum lovable product? And I'll go, no, because you won't ever find on my roadmaps anywhere minimum lovable product. Because minimum lovable product is an underpinning philosophy in how you develop a product. You know, you don't develop a feature that is just lovable and has no purpose. You kind of define out a feature and then you make it lovable by the things that you put in there. So for example, um, in the TravelX Money app that we've launched, we've put a couple of moments of delight in there around when the app crashes. Like people, the app crashes, normally people go, that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. But actually you can create a moment of delight through that. Um, so for example, if the app crashes, one of the error messages says, you know, we got 99 problems, but currency ain't one. Um, so you do that, you run customer testing on that, just makes people laugh when they read it. You know, no one goes, I'm pissed that the app just closed down. They're kind of like, oh no, the app made me laugh. Um, so you can find minimum lovable moments, and minimum lovable product within the existing product without having you know, its own distinct features. There are other things like in our apps, if you are going to Spain, on the checkout screen, we say adios. If you go into France, we say bon voyage. If you go into Germany, we say good to reason. If you go into Australia, we say good day, mate, um, and other things like that. But really, it's about taking the existing product and just making it more lovable. Um, it can be error messages, field validation, confirmation screens. It's really an underpinning philosophy in everything we do. I mean, everything I've done, then actually a distinct feature or product on its own. I think that I touched on before about themed roadmaps and moving away from um, these Gantt chart style roadmaps. And actually, the more and more product owners I talk to, um, that seems to be a growing trend. And especially like when you go to um, different product meetups and things like that, there is more and more people who are saying, you know, yeah, I, I get this whole noose around my neck type of Gantt chart thing, you know, committing to things that I'm never going to be able to do or are unrealistic to do, are going to be out of date when I come around doing them. So actually, um, the, the building roadmaps around themes is a really positive trend, um, I think. Hopefully it doesn't get bastardized like MVP and people start to misinterpret it and misuse it and maybe try and frame customer problems into features, um, which I've seen a couple of people try and do before now. Like they write the customer problem and then tag on the end, you know, I will solve this customer problem by building a rate tracking feature or by building this. It's kind of, what's the point in having the customer problem if you didn't jump straight into the solution anyway? Um, but yeah, more and more we've got this trend towards um, themed roadmaps, uh, which I think will continue. We've also um, definitely a trend um, at TravelX, and I'm not sure how widely this is uh, used, but it's having what we call wigs, which are wildly important goals. Um, it comes from a book called The Four Disciplines of Execution. Um, and a wig says that every team should have one thing that they are incredibly focused on achieving. So everyone in the team could recite what their wildly important goal was. Um, but actually that trend really allows teams to have a focus on what they're doing. So and when I talked before about knowing your purpose, you know, and are you a bricklayer or are you building a cathedral? The wig actually helps that. It helps everyone every day when they come to work be aware that their goal for the next quarter or whatnot is this, and this is how it's going to be measured. And I think that's a real positive trend. I guess, again, people away from 
having operational type of metrics and looking at customer centric um, improvements and really focusing teams. So yeah, I would definitely say trends towards um, themed roadmaps is probably the most positive trend I've seen in the last couple of years. Um, but also wildly important goals is another trend which seems to be kicking off, which I also think it'll be massively positive. Probably the most worrying trend that I see recently is product owners who think they are UX or UI people. Um, are product owners that think they can jump to wireframes before user stories. Um, so whether or not they think they can do it or whether or not they're overly influenced by design teams who think they can do it. Um, but actually a trend towards jumping straight into solving a problem before you fully understood it um, is very worrying, I think. Um, any product owner who starts to show you wireframes before they've defined out what that product might look like um, isn't a good product owner, if I can be as bold as saying that. Um, any product owner who has got a design team and doesn't use them and thinks they can you know, build out UX before, I think um, poor product owners. Again, I've worked in teams where product owners will do the user stories, then do draft wireframes and give those wireframes to the design team to build their wireframes off. Um, and that's terrible because for one, the product owner kind of loves their own designs and you know, overly influences the design team to go down their own track. Um, but for two, it biases the design team's thinking because instantly they've seen a solution and no doubt they'll hang on that solution as a thing and an avenue that they can go and explore. Um, so yeah, I think uh, negative trend towards engineer, sorry, not engineers, product owners who increasingly think they uh, can fill a design void. Building um, a credibility and I think you can have a lot of credibility by understanding some of the technical elements. Um, uh, when I was a business analyst, I always described it as a translator between business and tech and being able to speak the two. Um, and I guess in product management, you could say it's customer and tech and kind of bridging the gap between the two. Speaking customer is kind of like the easy part because um, it's the part that comes most naturally to people. And speaking the tech is kind of the bit that's overlooked. And we expect the engineers to come more and more closer to the customer um, and kind of, I don't know, do that translation part for us in some instances. Um, so if I was working with new product owners, like the new product owners I have on my team, I always say you have to understand some of these technical details. If you look at APIs, for example, APIs are you know written in English for you to understand in key value pairs. You need to understand the APIs of your product inside out. When you go to an engineer and say, can we do this? You should already have a semblance of an idea in terms of your API management and can your API support this standard kind of thing? Or do you need to build out your APIs? That then gives you the credibility with the engineering team. You know, you're not taking unrealistic things to them that aren't possible. You can actually have a grown-up conversation with them about how the APIs might work and how you can do that. Um, so definitely understanding those technical details. In mobile apps, it's got to be the APIs that you understand. But in, I guess, adjacent product roles, it might not be the APIs. It might be something else. Um, but really, having that technical knowledge will give you some of the credibility that you so richly need um, to go build quality products. I say that especially to the new product owners in the team because they come in without the experience or the reputation. Um, it's easy for product owners who have done this for a while to, you know, I'm in a, a meeting with the engineers and I can just casually say, well, well, when I did this at Walmart to the 6 million customers that were using the app, it had this impact. And that kind of has a gravitas then translation between these multiple functions. Um, I think if you... So if you think of product management as a, as a function, the classic thing is to say it's the Venn diagram of you know, business, engineering, design, product is kind of like that tiny intersection in the middle that pulls those together. Those three Venn diagrams would spread, was it not for product? And design would go in their own direction, you know, engineering would go in their own direction, and the business would go off and do something different altogether. And product is the thing that ties all those things together. The only way that you can hold them together is by being that translator and translating very well. Um, ultimately, product management is the one function that you could turn around and say, we could do without, if you're a business, if you're looking at it ruthlessly. In the Six Sigma part of me says you could do without. So if you don't have design, you don't really have a product. You have no designs to build from. You don't have engineering, and you can't build anything. And you don't have a business, and that means you have zero users because no one markets the product. So without any three of those functions, a product just doesn't happen. You could argue if all three of those functions existed and product didn't, that the product would still launch and you know, would something would ship. But ultimately, for me, product management is about going from a bad product to a good product or a good product to a great product. And that's the value of a product manager. 
And that value is really added by that translation service and that, you know, being able to pull distinct groups of people together to form one coherent product team. Um, so yeah, I think one skill that any product owner can work on, doesn't matter how experienced you are, is that translation piece. And a, bit, a large part of that comes down to interpersonal skills and relationship building, as is so fundamental to product management. Um, but yeah, that the translator between multiple functions is absolutely fundamental to product management. Like I say, if, if you can't do that, then I don't even know why you're in the role because it's kind of like one of the main purposes of product. In time, product and design teams will converge in the sense of we'll still have product and design teams, but I don't think they'll be separate teams. I think they'll become one and the same team. I think when we think about crowded marketplaces like we exist in now, design is often the differentiator um, between products that do the same thing. So I think more and more will want design involved very early in the process from day one. So when we think about product managers ideating on product ideas and whatnot, um, quite often it's easier to treat it as a very linear process and go from you know product to design to engineering. Um, but I actually think more and more will come across product and design um, before we look at moving into an engineering stream where intrinsically those roles will be related. If you think of the purpose of both product and design, it's to be customer centric, it's to build products that customers love, the goals are kind of like inseparable between the two, despite the fact they do you know, distinctly different jobs. Um, excuse me. So I think we'll see a convergence of those two type of teams rather than those two type of roles. So don't ever think we'll be in the land where you have a product owner who's also like an interaction designer. Um, but I do think we'll be in a world where those two exist within the same small team um, rather than having distinctly separate teams like we have now. Whenever I interview product managers, one of the questions I always ask them is, is product an art or a science? Um, and kind of like, you can sit on both sides of this, you know, there's an artistic element to product management, Like the relationship building is arguably um, you know, very artistic in the sense of um, there isn't a methodology for it. The same with like gut feel, like the number of times we'll sit in a room with engineers and go, I can't justify why we should do this, but please trust my gut instinct that this is the right thing to do. Um, but also there's a scientific element. And I think one of the big changes that we'll see is a move towards a more scientific way of doing product management. You know, if you look at jobs to be done as a methodology, there's a distinct process you can follow that will get certain outcomes. I'm not saying those outcomes will always be positive and will always be you know, world-class game-changing products, but the methodology exists that will give you, you know, um, predictable, probable outcomes into that. So I think we'll move away from kind of product management, which is very gut feel and very um, instinct based into this more methodical way of looking at products. Um, and that will be an, an evolution into that um, from where we are today. More and more, you'll see things like jobs to be done, and needs and wants analysis and other tools like business model canvassing and other things, which will lead to this more scientific way of doing products. I think the, the lean way of fail fast, you know, fail often, fail fast, learn lessons is all well and good. But ultimately, if we can get to those outcomes without those failures, then that will be an overwhelmingly positive change for product. Um, so I think the move towards a more scientific way of doing product management um, is highly probable um, and will probably be one of the biggest evolutions. So if you imagine the, the world of scientific product management, you would kind of take those failures or those learnings as inputs into the overall process. You know, you would use them as, um, I guess you've got like garbage in, garbage out style of stuff. But if you learn good validated lessons, you would feed them into the product management science class that would then give you some outcome, which was, you know, a new product or something different to do. So there would definitely be this predictable way of doing it.